my sincere thanks to all of you for participating in this event. Uh, my name is uh, Chiang Zha, and uh, I'm a faculty associate with the York Center for Asian Research, or WICA. Um, it is a great pleasure uh, for me to moderate this event, uh, which inaugurates WICA's celebration of its 20th anniversary featuring a talk by Professor Shi Bao Guo. Uh, so this is certainly an important, significant moment uh, for WICA and for those who are associated with WICA. So I'm gonna uh, invite uh, Professor uh, Aberdeen Kusno to speak uh, on this occasion. Um, Aberdeen um, is the director of WICA. He's also uh, the professor of faculty of environmental and urban change at the York University. Abidin, over to you. Thank you, Jiang. Thank you, everyone, for being here uh, with us uh, today. Uh, uh, I'm Abidin Kusno, as Jiang has already introduced me, Director of uh, York Center for Asian Research. So let me start by acknowledging that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anisnabek, the Chipiwa, the Haudenosaunee and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations and the Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Since our events remotely or in person uh, take place on lands of people from whom they have been taken, we should always try to provide a space for conversations and reflections on the struggles of the dispossessed. On behalf of WICA, it gives me a pleasure to welcome you all to this event to help us launch WICA's 20th anniversary celebration, which is organized around a series of events under the theme of reimagining Asian and Asian diaspora studies. WICA was established in 2002 it inherited a solid area studies foundation from what was then called the Joint Center for Asia Pacific Studies between uh, University of Toronto uh, and York University, uh, which started, I think, in 1974. Um, I remember the first director, Peter van der Gist, indicated some 17, 18 years ago uh, that I quote here, through the activities of all our members, we have created an identity that includes all four areas included in our mandate. That is South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Asian diaspora, end quote. Now there are at least two interesting assumptions, uh, or so we put it imaginaries uh, in this statement that we could reflect on today. The first is, in area studies, knowledge tends to be produced and organized territorially. Second one is that there is, there is seemingly a no contradiction between Asian studies and Asian diaspora studies, yeah, which is very interesting to me. So WICA is somehow known as the one, when it comes to Asian studies and Asian diaspora studies, you know, the one which is two or the two which is one. Yeah, and this is pretty unconventional. So I would like to propose that we use this 20th anniversary celebration as an occasion to reflect on some of the following issues. First is the fact that Arya studies emerge as a child of empire due to its origins in the colonial expansion of European powers driven by commercial and political interests. So the questions are, what would be the way to come to terms with the colonial origins of Asian studies? How should we rework it? What have we done to decolonize Asian studies? The second issues relate to how to locate Asian diaspora studies, say in Canada. What does it mean for us to do Asian and Asian diaspora studies in the landscape of central indigenous racial minority and immigrant? How do we deal critically with settler colonialism and its racial constructions of self and the other? 
of Asians, not only as minorities and immigrants, but also subjects who are involved in the reproductions of the capitalist logics of settler colonialism. The third one is the potential and the challenges of the conceptual linkages between area studies and diaspora studies, especially in the present geopolitical context. How should we rethink Asia or say China in the global South and in the Western metropole today? How might we develop a new and critical scholarship on Chinese diaspora in today's geopolitics and geoculture. So I want to thank Professor Kuo Si Pao for sharing with us today his research on transnationalism, diaspora studies, and Chinese immigrants in Canada. I want to thank my colleague Lily Cho and John Michel Monshan for taking part in the conversations, and my special thanks to. Jiang Cha for initiating and organizing this event, which I think is a very important beginning for reimagining Asian and Asian diaspora studies. And also uh, thanks to uh, Joe Wong for joining us to launch this event. Uh, and lastly to Alicia and Alex, uh, we, we can't thank you enough for all of your supports. Uh, thank you and best wishes to all of you, to all of us, or productive and enjoyable event in the celebrations of WICAS uh, 20th anniversary. Just a second. Uh, I used to use gong to do the lounge, but this is my. Dun, 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 dun. So it is lounge, Jiang. All over Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everything. This is very ceremonial uh, for the celebration. Uh, thanks, everything. Uh, before, uh, let's move on. Uh, before we have uh, Professor Gu's um, presentation today, we, we also have a, a, a entertainment uh, provided by uh, Professor Jiu Ang. Uh, let me introduce um, Professor Jiu Ang uh, briefly. Um, he is uh, also a WICA faculty associate and a director of the uh, Sensorium Center for Digital Art and technology in the School of Arts, Media, Performance, and Design at York University. So he will be introducing a short video that features um, the students, York students' work um, in the virtual environments on being Chinese in Canada. I want uh, I need to highlight um, this work was uh, inspired by a guest lecture by uh, Professor Li Li Cho, who is also a uh, discussant at today's event. So, Joe, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tang Zha. Uh, let me share my screen really quickly. Uh, and yes, I would also like to extend my invitations to everyone on this call. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, spending an afternoon together. Uh, I would also like to celebrate along with you, Abedin, and the rest of the YCAR family. Uh, congratulations on the 20th anniversary. Uh, as mentioned, I uh, am an assistant professor in AMPD, uh, and particularly in the Department of Computational Arts, and I also direct our faculty's organized research unit entitled Sensorium, the Center for Digital Art and Technology. Um, this today, however, um, is a class that I, uh, that I ran uh, last semester, semester that I just finished, entitled Virtual Communities, uh, Digital Activism and Social Justice. Uh, where, uh, you know, I, I really was thinking of um, accentuating the position, positionalities of our students uh, at AMPD and particularly also in the digital media program uh, where we have a vast majority uh, of students who are racialized minorities. Uh, and in fact, in this particular class, we had 70% of our students uh, actually report uh, that they do not have English as their first language. So what are mediums or means that we can accentuate the identities and individuation processes as they live uh, away from their homes, away from their families, and uh, you know, somewhat separate from their cultures as well? Uh, that, you know, what are these new uh, and emerging methods that we can accentuate these? Um, so I will uh, invite you uh, here in to uh, explore our gallery. This is an assignment that we created called the Theater of Individuation. 
and uh, you know, this, this is something that's very apparent, I think, in this unfolding relationship uh, between uh, settler uh, and, uh, and indigenous, I think, but, but also in uh, migrant uh, and, uh, and new homes uh, and newcomers. Uh, so uh, please go to the virtual gallery. Uh, there is a video over here that I will run uh, and um, I will start that. Uh, I'll give you a short excerpt of these. So in particular, these are works that uh, are built on a virtual platform entitled uh, called Mozilla Hubs. Uh, some of them are on Mozilla Hubs and some of them are actually just on Zoom or YouTube. Uh, but you can go in there through either a virtual reality headset uh, or you can experience them in the browser. Uh, it's all fine. Uh, in this project, uh, the group members chose food as a theme, surprise, surprise, <laughs> and uh, the virtual environment is organized according to uh, four of the cities uh, that the students were from in China, Shanxi, Nanjing, Qingdao, and Chongqing, uh, and they were arranged according to uh, the uh, iconic foods of the four cities. Uh, comprised of uh, sour, salty, bitter, and spicy. This incidentally made me a huge fan of Shanxi vinegar. Uh, I must say, I, I, I eat it almost every meal now. Uh, this is a work uh, by four students uh, around Tai Chi Chen, and uh, um, apparently uh, when they were growing up, this was something that they had to learn. Uh, and uh, you know, being here in, in Canada, nobody really uh, is, is um, you know appreciates uh, the way that Tai Chi Chen has has really um, been a part of their their culture and their childhood growing up. Uh, this also being the time around Chinese New Year, uh, we had a group that was teaching uh, us how to make dumplings uh, and also talking about uh, some of the ingredients that went into this and, and uh, some of the ingredients that you can find back home and, and, uh, and some that you can find here in Canada. Uh, further on, we also had a language lab. Uh, this is a multicultural group of students uh, that, had, um, uh, that was teaching us um, words from uh, the different national origins of India, Italy, China, and Vietnam. Uh, there was another group that focused on individual identity um, and uh, multicultural identities through art practices. Um, uh, this um, group uh, focused on Chinese New Year as a celebration, and so they made a Shi He Yuan, and uh, they uh, also had some really beautiful models. Uh, of dragons and, and, uh, and videos around uh, dumpling making as well. Uh, and uh, this was a group um, where they did multicultural uh, food uh, demonstrations as well, where you would progressively go through um, a, a house uh, and get to dessert at the end of it. Uh, and last but not least, uh, there was a group, uh, this is the last group, uh, four different cultural backgrounds. Again, you know, thinking of uh, virtual mediums uh, as a way for self-expression uh, and uh, creating uh, or accentuating of personal cultural identity. So you can see here multiple different layers uh, of traditional clothing, but also uh, some futuristic designs. Um, so I, I think in, in a whole, you know, it's, I, I've been really excited about the way the students have taken um, to this uh, experience uh, and the way that they've used it as a platform for expression. So, so really, um, this uh, assignment uh, showed us, um, you know, this very important role of emerging digital and virtual platforms uh, in reaffirming the cultural identities, uh, especially of international students, and the way creativity and creative expression can be a tool towards self-determination. Uh, so with that, I thank you so much for this time and I invite you to uh, explore that website on your own time. Thanks. Thank you, um, Professor Chiu Wang. Uh, that, that, that is really fascinating, uh, um, uh, the video. Uh, all right, uh, let's move on to have Professor um, Guo's um, presentation today, uh, which is titled uh, Reimagining Chinese Diaspora Studies in a Transnational World. Uh, this title fits perfectly uh, with the theme of WICA's uh, 20th anniversary celebration, uh, which is Reimagining Asian and Asian Diaspora Studies. So let me introduce um, Professor Guo briefly. Uh, Dr. Shibao Guo uh, is a professor at uh, Wokland School of Education, University of Calgary. Over the past 20 years, as a transnational academic and a scholar, Professor Guo has developed research expertise in the areas of transnational migration, diaspora studies, Chinese immigrants in Canada, ethnic and 
race relations, and comparative and international education. His research has been uh, funded by a number of organizations, including SHIRC, uh, Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, International Organization for Migration and Education International. Professor Guo has numerous publications, including books, journal articles, and book chapters. His latest books include Decolonizing Lifelong Learning in a Context of Transnational Migration, which is published in 2020 by Relage, Immigration and Racial and Ethnic Studies in 150 Years of Canada, uh, Retrospects and Prospects, um, that was published in 2018 by Boreal Sense. He's the former president of the Canadian Ethnic Studies Association and the Comparative International Education Society of Canada. Currently, he is a co-editor of Canadian Ethnic Studies and two book series for Boreal Science um, publishers, uh, namely Transnational Migration and Education and the Spotlight on China. Most recently, uh, Professor Guo guest edited a special issue of the Journal of Ethnic and Migration Studies on the theme of uh, Chinese uh, diaspora studies in a transnational world. This special issue offers findings and a theorization to stimulate further research and scholarly work on the topics about Chinese transnational diasporas. Um, so now we're going to have the um, Professor Guo's presentation, and I will introduce two discussions after presentation. So, Professor Guo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Jia, and uh, I'm delighted to be here to uh, join everybody to celebrate the 20th anniversary of WICA, which I just learned the acronym. And, uh, and uh, thank you for the invitation and particularly want to thank uh, Professor Chang Jia for coordinating the whole process. And uh, also want to extend my best wishes to everybody uh, in the center of WICA. Okay, so um, this is, uh, the title of my presentation, and uh, so reimagining China diaspora studies in a transnational world, and uh, so this is the outline. So I'll get started with historical context, and then move on to talk about some of the terms. And then I shift to uh, uh, transnationalism and diaspora as concepts. And then uh, talking about the, really the key components of today's talk, uh, talking about really the analytical constructs of Chinese diasporas in the uh, transnational world with a focus on hypermobility, hyperdiversity, and hyperconnectivity. So what I'm aiming to do today is examine the changing nature of Chinese diasporas in a transnational um, world, and, and also its concomitant implications for Chinese diaspora, diaspora studies um, as well internationally. So, um, yeah, that's basically the outline. And after that, I will talk about emerging research questions and uh, future research directions. And hopefully we still have a bit of time for comments and questions as well. Uh, so that's that. Uh, so Dr. Jack, can you, do, do you see, uh, if this is a full view, now is a full view. If I do yeah, that's this, full. Yeah. yeah, if I do this, you don't see a full view, is that right? Yeah. Okay. All right, okay. So uh, just to move on and uh, 
because I would like to refer to some of the notes. Looks like if I exit this, and uh, so you won't get the full view, which is, uh, which is too bad. It, is there another way of doing this? Um, I doubt. Um, okay. Otherwise, you need to have a print um, of okay. the notes. Okay, well, all right. But anyhow, so let me get started um, with the land acknowledgement. So today I speak to you from the University of Calgary, which is located on the traditional territories, the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, includes the Kiska, Bikini, uh, Kanai First Nations, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearsbro, and Wesley First Nations. So the city of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3 uh, as well. So as a fairly new member uh, of, uh, of Canada, and I'm really grateful to the reception I received from people of this land, which I now call uh, home. We'll also talk a little bit about my own research uh, interests, which really stems from my own position as a transnational scholar who has moved extensively from one national context to another for both education and research. And uh, I'd also have experience living between cultures in transnational context uh, as well. Uh, another note about myself in terms of research, uh, which I adopt uh, interdisciplinary approach. And uh, so uh, basically using intersecting met methodologies across disciplines, including education, sociology, political philosophy, as well as uh, history. So to get on with uh, the uh, topic itself, I will start with uh, some historical context. So in terms of Chinese uh, migration, it does have a long history. Some scholars even trace back to, you know, a Silk Road and uh, as long as that. But I think uh, most scholars really refer to the 12th century as the point where Chinese migration started. But a large scale migration really began in the 16th century. Uh, but at that time, the size remained small and uh, about 100,000 and mainly uh, confined to Southeast Asia. And uh, so mass migration started in the 19th, mid 19th century to Americas, Australia and Europe, et cetera. And this is where I think you know, Canada got involved and particularly that's to do with the expansion of capitalism and also colonialism, et cetera. Uh, so by the early 1940s, there were about 8.5 million Chinese worldwide. And also uh, since the mid 80s, 1980s, with the open door policy and basically China has created uh, emerging middle class families and who can afford to travel to mobile, to be mobile. And that really marked the beginning of a new wave of Chinese migrants. So uh, in terms of uh, the, um, the historical part, I think the, the scholarly work on the uh, periodization of the history of Chinese overseas uh, is quite varied with no, numerous uh, scholarly interpretations and conceptualizations. But there is a major uh, dichotomy. So that is uh, the Chinese overseas was seen as either a part of, uh, of the greater China or a separate entities and the settlements contextualized in local conditions and existences of life. So what is central to the debate is really the comprehension of soldiering and how much China should be considered as the homeland and also reference point for the conceptualization of Chinese overseas populations. So we'll come back to that um, again. So in terms of the uh, terms, there are really multiple terms uh, referring to Chinese migrants. So some of these terms, uh, including Chinese sojourners and often uh, using Chinese reference point, particularly the return 
one day to the homeland. Uh, overseas Chinese, uh, this is a more kind of overall broad term and uh, referring to Baqiao and Huajing. And the Chinese overseas, so this is a more recent term and particularly in the academic field. Uh, so people often ref referring to this term and which is often regarded as much broader rather than just uh, sojourners. So uh, particularly for people who are in this field and uh, uh, if, if you, if, you might have come across the Journal of Chinese Overseas and also for ESCO, that's the International Society for the Study of Chinese Overseas, and which is a meeting uh, this year at UC Berkeley. Uh, UC Berkeley, yeah. And uh, so you can see uh, in the academic field, people now moving to the term Chinese uh, overseas. So the distinctions between these terms is becoming moot over time. So in light of the recent Chinese, uh, the transnational turn in China uh, studies, and particularly uh, this includes uh, uh, Chinese movements uh, described as hybrid mobility, return migration sometimes. So I should put uh, uh, probably a quotation mark around return, circular migration, transmigration, and double diaspora uh, as well. So um, yeah, so these terms, uh, there's no really agreed on kind of, uh, you know, one term, but I think certainly um, it illustrates some of the dynamics and the complexities and also the evolving nature of Chinese diasporas. So in this talk, as well as in the special issue, I guess edited for jams, which Dr. Uh, Jia mentioned at the beginning. So I deliberately used the term Chinese diasporas, plural form. Uh, so uh, rather than singular uh, Chinese diaspora, so to indicate that there's no monolithic bounded entity known as the Chinese diaspora, rather, um, I will explain later in this talk, the Chinese overseas are hyper diverse rather than monolithic. So, uh, and particularly this matter it revolves around how the term diaspora is defined when referring to Chinese di diaspora population as Chinese di diasporas, particularly in the era of transnationalism. And uh, it comes back to this question, again, how much China should be considered as the reference point and homeland for Chinese overseas uh, populations, particularly when you're referring to um, Chinese diaspora as plural forms. So these are basically the historical context and also uh, the definition of key terms. The next part is really uh, some of the concepts which um, are used to guide uh, this talk as well as uh, my work on uh, the theorization of Chinese diasporas in a transnational world. So therefore, this paradigm, this shifting paradigm of transnationalism is really important. So we know with the development of modern transportation and advanced communication technologies, so migration has shifted, has shifted from primarily international to transnational. So as multiple, circular, and return migrations rather than a singular Greek journey from one sedentary place, such as from India to Canada or from China to Canada. So occur across transnational spaces. So as such, migrants are no longer expected to make a sharp and definitive break, break from their homelands. So instead, yet their daily lives depend on multiple and constant interconnections across international borders and whose public identities are configured in relationship to more than one nation state. So this is a, uh, this is a really important, particularly, um, uh, particularly when we come to examine the changing nature of um, Chinese diasporas, uh, rather than putting in a very static, monolithic uh, kind of context, and uh, it is it is contextualized in a circular kind of uh, uh, a circular uh, movement. 
So uh, we understand the early articulation of transnationalism uh, was by cultural uh, anthropologists started in the early 1990s, but it was really sociologists and the general politics who was most responsible for popularizing and expanding the use of transnationalism. So the process of transnational involves significant proportion of persons in the relevant universe. So the activities interest possess certain stability and the resilience over time uh, as well. So the content of these activities is not captured by some pre-existing uh, concept. Uh, so um, usually transnationalism uh, in terms of activities can grouped under three types, economic, political, and uh, social, cultural. So the economic is about economic uh, entrepreneurship, the transnational political activities. So they usually aim for the achievement of political power and influence the sending our receiving uh, country. The social cultural uh, transnationalism orients towards the reinforcement of a national identity abroad or the collective enjoyment of cultural events uh, and goods. So uh, transnational activities actually, there have been a lot of debates regarding the role of transnationalism, whether it facilitates integration or it put barriers to integration. So people like Portis argue that transnational activities can actually facilitate a successful uh, uh, act adaptation, and particularly by providing more economic opportunities uh, and, and mobility. So uh, the overall bearing of transnational activities on sending countries is positive, both economically as well as um, politically uh, as well. So overall, transnationalism challenged the region, territorial nationalism that defines the modern nation state. So pause its migration population as a fluid and with multiple identities that are grounded both in their society of origin and settlement simultaneously. So you can see that simultaneity as well as multiple embeddedness are very important in the whole uh, paradigm of transnationalism as well as transnational identity formation, denotes that identity is no longer singular, but plural and also always uh, evolving uh, as well. So that's basically uh, transnationalism, which is very important for the examination of uh, Chinese task force. So the other concept which is also important is the notion of diaspora. So as an early notion of diaspora, so it's often referred to the traumatic dispersal of a victimized group, uh, particularly from original uh, homeland, and also the saliency of the homeland in the collective memory of forcible dispersed uh, groups. So you can see that two keywords, one is the dispersal, and then the other one is the, uh, the, um, the collective memories of the homeland. Uh, the, uh, Victimized group we, we often refer to as the Jewish uh, Jewish group, uh, which is often seen as the prototypical diaspora. And uh, later, the concept has been extended to include labor, trade, imperial, and cultural uh, diasporas as well. So, uh, reviewing the overall literature in the past uh, twenty or thirty years, or even forty years now, and so the, the primarily four popular definitions of diasporas, starting from the mid 1980s, Connor book simply defines diaspora as that segment of a people living outside the homeland. And after that is suffering who further developed his definition of diaspora to include notions of collective memory, alienation, and a commitment to ancestral homeland. And soon after that, as we know, Robin Cohen, and who, who is quite big and quite influential in the whole um, scholarship diaspora, and drew upon the classical tradition and the suffering insights to further expand that definition to include nine traits of our diaspora, which he calls strengths of a diasporic uh, role. So these are the nine common uh, features. It's about the dispersal, 
from original homeland, expansion of a homeland is such a work or pursuit of trade or colonial activities, a collective memory and a myth about the homeland, a idealization of the real or imagined ancestral land, a return movement, and a strong ethnic group consciousness, a troubled relationship with whole societies, such as you know, racism, a sense of solidarity with a co ethnic members in other countries, and the possibility of a distinctive, creative, enriching life in host countries. So following Cohen, uh, so Van here, and he further conceptualizes diasporas very broadly as populations which satisfy three minimal criteria. So that is the population is dispersed from a homeland to two or more other territories. Second, the presence abroad is enduring. And third, there's some kind of exchange, either social, economic, political, or cultural. So among all um, different definitions, so what is the problematic is that uh, there is no one single definition of diaspora that is widely accepted in the literature as contemporary definitions of diaspora. Uh, uh, because they are quite varied. And they also illustrate that it is essentially contested concept uh, as well. And some scholars also argue that uh, the concepts, uh, so yeah, that's basically the concept of diaspora. And uh, so now I think it's a good idea to pull the two together in terms of uh, you know, where they converge when it comes to examining um, uh, the changing notion of Chinese diaspora or Asian diasporas. So some uh, scholars have argued that the concepts of uh, transnationalism and transnational community are broader and more inclusive than the concept of diaspora and diasporic communities. More generally, transnationalism is a broader concept than diaspora, and transnationalism also has, uh, has, not, uh, has not gone beyond the scholarly community, entered immigrant, and I think has not gone beyond the scholarly community and entered immigrant and ethnic community organizations. So at the same time, the concept of diaspora has been more sharply criticized than the counterpart of transnationalism for moving towards essentializing diaspora as the ethnic label rather than a framework of analysis, particularly I think is a heavy reliance on homeland as a reference point. So that's basically, I think, you know, uh, a point to, uh, to put together I think the two concepts to see uh, how it inform, I think, my work in terms of uh, the examination of the changing notion of Chinese uh, diasporas. So, um, yeah, uh, so far we have set up the context as well as the concepts. So next, so I will move uh, to the next part uh, is, which is really uh, present uh, analytical constructs or theorization, if you like, of China diasporas in a transnational world. So based on what I have uh, presented so far in the whole context of Chinese migration and under the guidance, particularly a notion of a transnational diaspora. So these constructs uh, are hypermobility, hyperdiversity, and hyperconnectivity. So I uh, examine uh, um, one, uh, each term one by one. So let's take a look at the high hypermobility. And uh, so that this one basically covers the global dispersal of the Chinese uh, migration or Chinese uh, diaspora population. So one key feature of the overseas Chinese hypermobility is its sheer size and volume. But for these, there are really different numbers, uh, so which are quite confusing 
uh, particularly if uh, you if you come across these numbers for the first time. And basically, the Chinese government claims 60 million overseas Chinese worldwide. And if you look at Wikipedia, and uh, uh, so earlier when I saw um, two years ago, it had a 2018 estimate uh, to be 50 million, a million people. And now it seems that is gone. And now back to a 2010 estimate, so to be 40 uh, million. So but why influential figure is uh, Dudley Poston? who has done tremendous amount of work over, I don't know, the last two decades. I think almost every five years or so, he updates the literature and also the numbers, provide a really insightful kind of uh, analysis of the, uh, the size and the volume of the Chinese, overseas Chinese uh, population. So the last time he published uh, was in 2016, based on data uh, he collected in 2011, uh, I believe uh, he relies heavily on uh, data from uh, Taiwan's, uh, I think, overseas Chinese uh, um, uh, department. So at that time, he um, estimated 40 uh, 0.3 million at uh, an increased rate of 1.2%. Uh, percent. And uh, so uh, basically following that and uh, calculated, uh, I think, uh, you know, from 2012 to 2019, so added another 4.6 million. So that basically uh, put us to, uh, I think, uh, 50 million by 20. Uh, 20. That seemed to be a little bit uh, uh, confusing, uh, but I know. So I can go back to uh, the paper where I uh, where I wrote about. Let me just uh, clarify uh, a little bit in terms of uh, what I said in the in the in the in the paper, just uh, to um, straighten this up. Okay, so yeah, so uh, Paulston basically uh, he talked about 2012, 2011. So there were 40.3 million Chinese residing in 148 countries of the world outside the Chinese mainland, Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, and excluding tourist visitors and short-term residents. So this figure rep represents an increase of almost 5 million in the last, uh, in the last 10 years period between uh, 2001 and 2011 in the annual growth rate of around to 1.2%. So if this annual growth rate remains unchanged until the outbreak of COVID-19 in 2012, 2020, so the overseas Chinese worldwide from 2012 to 2019 should have added another 4.6 million people. So using this trajectory, I think the current overseas Chinese population should be uh, well over 45 million. So more than five times its 1948 count that also reported by posting. So I just want to clarify that it should be 45 million rather than uh, 50 million. But overall, what I want to say is, you can see um, it's usually in a range because I think uh, uh, a lot to do how uh, the, uh, the oversight, the, the si overall size of overseas Chinese population was counted in uh, different countries. But uh, usually it ranges between 40 and 60 uh, million. And uh, as regard as the third largest diaspora in the world after the German and Irish diasporas, uh, Posting argued that these two uh, diasporas, although in size they are larger than the Chinese diaspora, but um, the majority of these two diasporas they live in the United States. So, but on the other hand, the Chinese 
um, overseas Chinese population have spread virtually to every corner of the world, as Porton argued. Uh, so uh, across 148 countries. So this is what uh, reported in the posting article in terms of the 10 countries with the largest overseas Chinese population and the percentage of what total of C overseas Chinese. So you can see the countries which stand out are Indonesia, which account for about 20%. After that is Thailand, that's 19%. Malaysia is 16%. And United States, 10%. Singapore is close to uh, 7%. Uh, Canada is sitting at 3.75. So that's the first, uh, first feature of hypermobility. The second striking feature of the hypermobility is the shift in the population distribution from Asia to the Americas and to a lesser extent to Europe and Oceania as well. So this number is very fascinating. So if you look at early 1980s, about 90% of the, of the Chinese uh, migration migrants, so they were in Asia, that's 90%. So by 2011, so uh, that decreased to 23, uh, sorry, 73.3%. So that distributed in, across 35 Asian uh, countries. So in comparison, you can see the changes in the Americas, which is quite interesting. Basically in 1990s, about 90%. So lived in the Americas, including uh, Canada and the US. So by 2001, that changed, increased to 17.1%. And by 2011, that increased to 18%. 0.6%. So you can see that's double. So these figures basically indicate that Chinese diasporas are now very much a global diasporas. So that's the second nature, a second feature. The third feature about the hypermobility of overseas Chinese uh, is, is about uh, this transnational framework, which consider the diasporic soldier is neither unidirectional nor final, but rather as multiple and circular. So as such, hypermobility also means that overseas Chinese will likely continue to move, to move over time as distinctive passage, passages in the life, life uh, cycle. So, uh, and in terms of the future trends, and uh, of course, I think the, China, the mobility of the Chinese population will be kind of influenced by the local, um, the government uh, uh, policies. But overall, I think uh, scholars such as Posting uh, predict that uh, will continue to grow, uh, uh, particularly in countries like uh, uh, North America and uh, other OECD countries. But the number of uh, Chinese in Africa particularly will likely in experience the greatest relative increase in percent percentage because of China's strength in economic and the political ties with uh, African uh, countries. So that's basically uh, the hypermobility, but there is a myth though. So that myth, um, that, that's summarized basically the uh, hyper uh, mobility. So in terms of its, uh, its size, in terms of uh, uh, its uh, uh, the shift, particularly from Asia to uh, North America and Europe, and also this overall change uh, from unidirectional to multiple and circular. So the second uh, uh, the second construct uh, uh, which I would like to present today is the notion of hyper uh, diversity. So when I start with this theorization, so I used um, Vertrock's uh, super uh, mobility as a springboard to examine the changing nature uh, and particularly to challenge the myth, um, which is about the centralized characterization of the overseas Chinese basically present the group as a homogeneous and monolithic group coming from ancient China, uh, speaking the same language, they're sharing the same 
culture. So this uniform depiction of the Chinese as possessed of a single identity conceals a substantial diversity of Chinese diasporas across the world and evokes really negative stereotypes. And contrary to, the, to this popular uh, myth, so research has shown that overseas Chinese are heterogeneous to the extent that they can be classified as a hyper-diverse group with substantial subgroup differences. So let me just uh, illustrate how these subgroup differences and how uh, the hyper-diversity has been manifested overall. So the characteristics of the overseas Chinese hyperdiversity can be disaggregated by their origin, destination, citizenship, language, immigrant category, occupation, education background, and social economic status. So if you look at the origin, we all know, uh, particularly up to the end of the world war, and they mainly come from two uh, uh, provinces of China. So one is Guangdong and the other one is Fujian. So they're both located at South China and also uh, Southeast China. The other province which has also contributed quite a bit uh, to the overall population growth is Zhejiang uh, province, particularly as Wendou City and Qingtian uh, uh, County. So uh, this is another uh, uh, province which contribute substantial number of overseas Chinese, particularly to Europe and, and, and also South Africa as well. Uh, but since 1980s, things have changed as the major source of Chinese migrants shifted uh, to Hong Kong because of uh, its painting hand over to China at that time in 1997. And also with a rise in China and its economic uh, boom, uh, basically created conditions for the mobility of Chinese people, which has taken China to a, a new era of emigration phase. Uh, so in terms of their origins, uh, have created a substantial varieties of Chinese with subgroup differences. So they're no longer just from China's Fujian or Guangdong uh, province. And also their complexities of ex experience and self-interpretation of their cultural and social, social status have really kind of evolved as well. So use um, Vancouver as an example. So the overseas Chinese community would include the following groups. So descendants of the pre-1980 immigrants, often we call, refer to them as the Lao Hua Chiao. A second group are Hong Kong and the Taiwan immigrants since uh, 1980s, we call them Xinhua Chiao. So recent mainland Chinese immigrants, particularly from uh, different provinces of China, and these are primarily immigrant professionals. And as well as often ignored group, they are the ch Chinese trans migrants from Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnamese, Laos, Cambodia, Philippines, Peru, Jamaica, South Africa, and other uh, places. So I'm sure um, among today's uh, uh, audience, so I'm sure there are people who are also from that category uh, as well. And uh, so in the public figures, and uh, we know um, in, in Toronto, I think uh, a CBC News host, uh, the national host, uh, 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 Andrew Chan and his family background is from the Caribbean and uh, so original from China's Guangdong province and uh, uh, later we migrate to, uh, to Canada and uh, so uh, definitely they are members of that group. So that's about uh, origins and the second hyperdiversity is about its linguistic diversity. So uh, 
in terms of that aspect, Chinese trans migrants, the group we just talked about, they speak a minimum of three different languages. So including the official language, the pre, the re-migration country, say for example, it's Andrew Chan's family. And uh, so they migrated to Canada. And uh, so they would speak either French and English. Uh, I would assume properly Andrew speaks both and the language of previous host countries. Um, but I guess in the uh, colonial uh, uh, Jamaica, I think still um, uh, English, but in other contexts such as uh, Malaysia and Indonesia, but definitely language of the previous host countries and possibly one Chinese native language such as Mandarin or Cantonese. So this is about the trans migrants, but even among Chinese from China alone, so their native tongue could include a, a, a wide variety, uh, such as Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese, Hokkien's, Taiwanese, and Shanghainese uh, as well. And the third feature of the hyper mobility is about the education background, occupation, immigrant category, and social economic status. So we understand the early Chinese immigrants also referred to as huagong. So they are primarily coolie workers or dangerous, you know, laborers and uh, who work in uh, mining industry, like in, in Canada, railway construction, both Canada and the US, and, you know, agriculture, particularly um, sugar plantation uh, in the Caribbean and to domestic service, uh, et cetera. So another category, they are the Hua Shang migrants. So these are primarily traders and merchants. And nowadays they are among the contemporary overseas Chinese, they're well-educated professionals working as managers, professional investors and entrepreneurs, et cetera, et cetera. You can see they perform a variety of Chinese-ness in their local uh, context. So you can see in this sense, hyper diversity is an important hallmark of contemporary Chinese diasporas that distinguishes it from most other diasporas. So overseas Chinese bring with them a variety of Chinese-ness based on the context in which they have been a part of. And also the hyper diversity overseas Chinese attenuates the primordial notion of diaspora, which relies on particularly homeland of China and origin as is its criteria in defining uh, diaspora. So yeah, in the whole kind of uh, um, reimagining exercise, I see this as a very important part. And particularly, I think, you know, um, de mystify the whole, th that essentialized notion of, of Chinese, and the Chinese diaspora. And also in this sense, so I summarize, well, you recall the definition probably too long, but uh, uh, summarize everything in this uh, paragraph in terms of the term of overseas Chinese, the Chinese diaspora. So they represent a collectivity of individuals coming in different parts of the world, including PRC, Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, Singapore, Malaysia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, the Philippines, Jamaica, South Africa, et cetera, speaking different languages, including Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese, Hokkien's, Taiwanese, Vietnamese, African, Afrikaans, Af Afrikaans, English, French, Portuguese, Spanish, Yiddish, representing different citizenships, uh, including Chinese, Malaysian, Singaporean, Vietnamese, Laos, and British, and I believe in different world religions, including Buddhism, Taoism, Confucianism, Christianity, Islam, and living in different social and political sy uh, systems, uh, such as uh, uh, communi communism, uh, capitalism, and a combination of two. So you can see, again, the evolving nature, the diversity, and, and also uh, that uh, uh, complexity uh, as well. Okay, so that's um, what I would say about hyper diversity. So 
the very next one is hyperconnectivity. So I need to speed up, speed up a little bit, a little bit in terms of uh, the time. So from the very beginning of China's migration, so overseas Chinese mainland uh, connections with their homeland, uh, you really maintain that connection through intermittent visit and remittance. Uh, but because of the transnational migration, uh, um, so it really has created multiple homes and, and, and transnational relations. So it really uh, got us to problematize the notion of home and homeland, and particularly uh, for overseas Chinese, they may have multiple homelands. So the first generation Chinese um, are likely to see China as their homeland, but their, their descendants may see China as the homeland of the forebears uh, or the ancestral homeland. So particularly after re-migration to another country, some may find more attachment to the immediate country which they emigrated from, depending on how long they had uh, lived uh, there. And, uh, and also uh, a globalized economy permits greater uh, uh, connectivity and uh, particularly um, now living in a digital age. And uh, so I think a lot of things have changed in terms of uh, how we connect uh, with uh, the diaspora population. Uh, uh, making it more kind of uh, uh, instantaneous and continuously and dynamically and also uh, intimately. And also with the help of technology, particularly with the social uh, media, etc., we have seen the emergence of a virtual transnational diaspora as a new space for trans migrants to maintain diasporic uh, engagement. And also that overall uh, shift of citizenship as well. And so uh, we have seen uh, the notion of uh, flexible citizenship and astronaut. And uh, again, going back to that overall change from unidirectional to multiple and circular uh, movement. And also some of those hyperconnectivity, they're manifested in some of the examples such as transnational business networks and talent mobility in terms of the whole change from brain gain, brain drain to brain circulation. And, uh, and I think the, 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 the recent shifts demonstrate that the boundaries between diaspora, territory, and transnational migration have been uh, blurred. And uh, so uh, in the whole kind of uh, hyper uh, connectivity, so transnational social networks are important because they can connect with both state and society through both formal and informal means. So there are a lot of informal means, but we know even formally, uh, say for example, uh, the Chinese government as a kind of a connecting point, and then has has really strengthened its kind of overall mechanism, mechanism, and to build up that transnational social uh, network. So um, I think it's almost impossible to, to assess the set exact size, but uh, I think uh, uh, usually some of the uh, transnational social networks, so it can be class uh, organized into five categories. So, see for example, in the context of Canada, we see clan association, district, locality associations, fraternal political association, community wide, and also professional associations. So that's basically hyper connectivity and its manifestation in transnational business networks and that whole kind of brain circulation and uh, uh, as well. So uh, that brings us to so what and particularly um, the future uh, for, uh, uh, for research of uh, uh, transnational uh, diaspora studies. And uh, based on what we have uh, uh, presented today, so there's a need, we can see there's a need to develop new theoretical framework to better understand, to better theorize Chinese diasporas in a transnational 
world, and particularly in terms of ongoing and emerging research questions. So we need to explore the following aspects. One is transnational identity and citizenship. The second one is about second generation youth. The third one is about civic participation integration. And lastly, uh, is social exclusion and anti-Chinese uh, racism. And uh, so um, under transnational diaspora, so we have seen the emergence of multiple and transnational identities. And uh, so and we have seen in this, in this sense, I think empirical research is much needed. So on the Chinese diasporas in Canada and uh, US and also European countries regarding their multiple and transnational uh, identities. So, and also there is a dire need to research on multiple and transnational identities, particularly on, among second generation Chinese youth. And this includes research on engagement with education and uh, as well as their identity uh, construction. Another important aspect of, of substantive citizenship involves the practice of citizenship in terms of civic and political participation, or sometimes called uh, uh, active citizenship. So we need to ask the question of what forms and degrees of transnational citizenship exists among the Chinese in the diaspora and how much influence do transnational practice have on Chinese civic participation in the diasporas. And also uh, in terms of uh, integration and the economic uh, labor market integration, particularly among uh, immigrant professionals, they are important. And we need to explore the questions such as what are the ways in which integration and transnationalism are interrelated? Are there links between Chinese transnational mobility and the extent of the social, cultural, and labor market integration? And also, is there integration, transnationalism, and a diaspora nexus? And finally, in light of particularly the ongoing racism, racial discrimination, and uh, so I think we need to strengthen particular research in terms of uh, in anti-Chinese uh, sentiments. So coming to a conclusion, I think uh, radical changes uh, in the transnational world necessitate that we recast traditional studies of the Chinese beyond national and essentialized communities to encompass their circulatory cross-border movements and mobilities. So we need to address those emerging questions in terms of what are the forces behind the creation of transnational social spaces, the mechanism, roots, and the processes, as well as the consequences of these radical changes globally. How exactly is China defined with respect to citizenship, identities, and the blind. What does the future hold with respect to such phenomena giving a rise in China as an emerging superpower? And lastly, what are the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Chinese diaspora and their transnational uh, practices? Because we have seen a really a, a dramatic upsurge in racism and xenophobia since the outbreak of COVID-19. So I think my time has, is up and I will stop here. I really want to thank everybody for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Guo. Uh, uh, that is a really uh, a wonderful and rich uh, presentation. I'm sure uh, the participants and the audience uh, would have a lot to discuss. Actually, uh, we've got uh, uh, some feedbacks. Uh, and we're going to save the questions to the end, um, unless you have any burning question for clarification. Uh, there is a one which is about whether it is possible to post uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, we'll consult Professor Guo on that matter. And also, I want to um, inform the audience we um, have recorded this session, so we will post the video uh, 
sooner. So now um, let's move on to have the discussions, um, inputs and the responses. Um, today we have two distinguished um, discussions. Uh, let me introduce the discussions briefly. Um, the first one is, uh, let me introduce in alphabetic order. Uh, so first one, Dr. Lili Cho um, is the Assistant Professor of English and Associate Dean Global and Community Engagement in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies at York University. Her recent book, Mass Capture, Chinese Hat Tax and the Making of Non-Citizens is published by McGill Queen's University Press in 2021. It's a very new book. So this book examines the relationship between race, citizenship, and surveillance. Our second uh, discussant, uh, Dr. Jean-Michel Monjean, is a assistant professor uh, in the Department of Multidisciplinary Studies at the Glendon uh, College. And he's also the director of the Robots Center for Canadian Studies at York University. He's a distinguished fellow at the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. His research and focuses on the questions of mobility in gateway cities linking Canada to Asia. He currently works on documenting revitalization efforts for non-Mandarin Chinese languages in locations like Singapore and Vancouver. And also he leads a national team investigating the racialization of Chinese, Indian, Korean, international students to Canada. So, um, um, I will um, turn to the two discussions. Shall we follow the alphabetic order as well? So, um, Dr. Cho, you go first. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, first of all, I just want to do a, a practical thing. I dropped my headphones several times today. So if you have trouble hearing me, please drop something in the chat because I may have broken my headphones. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be working today, but just I just wanted to say that right first. Um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to discuss uh, Professor Guo's amazing and important keynote. And it's a great privilege, of course, to always join YCAR in any kind of celebration and, uh, and to be here with uh, Jean-Michel, who is so distinguished and fabulous. And it's always wonderful to share a stage with you. So thank you. I have some very brief comments um, in relation to the, the material that, that we've been presented with. And I think that one of the really, you know, as, as, as I was listening to the presentation and absorbing the important interventions that are being made, I thought a lot about what, uh, what we mean when we think about diasporas as an object of study. Uh, so by that, I mean, you know, with much of what, what some of the difficulty around studying diaspora for me has been is around trying to define its parameters, trying to understand its key contours. And then, you know, much of the empirical material that we've been presented with, you know, how many people, what are the languages? How do we understand the constitution of this group, which is, as you, as you know, hypermobile, hyperdiverse, constantly shifting. So how can we take uh, a, a really important conceptual concept like diaspora and also make it mobile, you know, in a way that reflects the group or the community that we want to, to think about. And one of the uh, thoughts that I had as I was thinking, as I was listening was, was to, to consider what it might mean to think about diaspora and in this case, Chinese diaspora as, uh, in terms of the subjects of diaspora first. So what might it mean, instead of thinking about studying diaspora as an object of imperial study, to think about the subjective experience of being in diaspora? What are the conditions of the passage? How have Chinese diasporic subjects arrived in the places where they are? And what might it mean to privilege the subjectivity of these experiences um, and to, you know, to risk letting go of trying to pin down, you know, the Chinese diaspora. And I think that this is what Professor Gao uh, opens with in many ways when, when he talks about the necessity of thinking about Chinese diaspora as plural, you know, that there isn't a singular diaspora and that the only way as, as academics that we might get credibly to studying uh, the concept of diaspora is to 
uh, really consider the diversity of, of, of this community. Um, I, and sorry, and I know that we're a bit pressed for time, so I won't go on and on. But what I want to do is very quickly um, then come to the end of what uh, what we what we received in this keynote to, in terms of thinking about uh, how how and how responses to something like anti-Chinese racism might be a kind of organizing what, what, how we might think of these responses or the necessity of these responses in terms of the constitution or subjective experience of being in diaspora. And in that, I think about the ongoing grief and collectivity uh, that emerges from these experiences and the, the ways in which we have to find spaces to hold this grief, to reflect on it and to think of, and to think through it. I was recently meeting with a group of Asian Canadian graduate students in Toronto. And one of the things that we talked about, which you know, I think really struck me, was the impact of the Atlanta, of the killings of the of the Korean women in Atlanta a year ago. We were coming up to a one-year anniversary of those deaths. And the ways in which they their frustration that uh, the, their, their white colleagues didn't understand how much grief they still hold, you know? And so people were very confused. They were like, but this was Atlanta. Those women were Korean, you're Chinese, you know? <laughs> like, you know? And, and part of what, what, um, what I thought about then was the ways in which the, the grief of the experiences of racism, which are transnational, which cut across communities uh, has not always been very visible. And we, in Toronto recently, just, just yesterday, got a new Toronto Police Board report to mark um, yet another spike in anti-Asian racism in Toronto. Um, it's increased year over year from the year before. And, every, and when I read that report, what I see is grief. Like what I see is unresolved grief. <laughs> I mean, there's so much more, but, but, but in terms of how we as a community might come together, I thought we haven't talked about how to mourn what, what has been happening <laughs> and continues to happen. And so when I think about the conditions of diasporic subjectivity and what it means to think about Chinese diasporas in the plural in the way that we've been offered in this generous keynote, I think a lot about how the affective and subjective experiences of diaspora uh, continue to be things that we might hold as we move forward as a community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Uh, Jim? Uh, thank you. Can you hear me well? Yeah. It's so nice being uh, part of YCAR virtually today and to read, because we had a chance to read um, Professor Guo's paper in advance. Um, thank you very much. I've been uh, using your work for a long time myself, so it was an honor uh, to go through it. Um, out of the presentation, I think something that comes through the paper that is important is the dialectical relationship between the concepts of hypermobility, hyperdiversity, and hyperconnectivity that the audience might not have the chance to fully understand um, in, in your work, which I think is very important in the tensions and the uh, intersections between those conditions. Um, in terms of my comments, I'll go quite quickly, but what I did is I looked over um, Professor Guo's uh, recent scholarship. Um, Professor Guo is quite a prolific scholar, <laughs> 20 peer review articles in the last 10 years. And so we could understand a bit better where this intervention fits. And I think the emerging questions uh, were quite interesting because they reflect continuity in uh, Professor Guo's um, scholarship over the, the last 10 years. And uh, I can uh, attest as well that Professor Guo's scholarship as the content of the keynote is inherently mobile, diverse and connected as well. Um, not necessarily following the emerging themes order that you presented, I think the complexities and the ongoing processes that are at play for uh, reconciling transnational identities with nationally grounded citizenship apparatuses is very important in Professor Guo's work in general from 2013 article on the teaching and living conditions of teachers in China or a more recent 2021 piece on the Chinese um, students in universities in China experiencing internationalization at home as a form of westernization. Professor Guo always tries to put forth an understanding of Chinese transnational diasporas as necessarily involved, involve, evolving 
uh, in reaction to constant restructuring of national institutions facing globalized realities. Uh, as I said, I won't be able to go all, through all, but Professor Guo, I'll send you my notes if you're interested in my perspective on that. Uh, this, the second theme, of course, uh, around the questions of living transnational lives, integrating one's physical community, and especially what it means for civic participation and how to see it. Again, uh, another 2013 article, Professor Guo, on the changing nature of work and learning of Chinese professionals in Canada, which are affected by racialization of foreign credentials. Uh, also in 2016, with the notion of double diaspora, uh, that influential, influential uh, piece from Professor Guo, speaking of the layered multiple and multi-directional forms of sojourning uh, for Chinese Kenyans living in Beijing, uh, really revealing um, the diversity of, of experiences. And I do um, invite the, audience to look at the two, two 2020 articles on uh, Chinese transnational academics to really show how each group, uh, depending on people's trajectories, identity markers, uh, and social categories will experience that very differently uh, as well. Uh, in terms of the social exclusion and anti-Chinese racism, Professor Guo's um, scholarship has always highlighted the importance of documenting these inequalities in order to um, to, to understand and, um, and surpass them. Um, and a 2021 piece, very interesting, showing how Canada's history of, of racism made it easier for the resurfacing of anti-Chinese racism during the pandemic, but really a work-long career of documenting um, the triple glass effect, for example, um, and other concepts and other realities that are very important, and not just for the Chinese diaspora, but also for um, Syrian refugee children um, in Canada. And lastly, uh, I will end on this, of course, the idea of second uh, generation and youth and the um, cross-generational practices. Uh, are they similar? Are they not? Uh, I'm not going to cite a specific article, but uh, Professor Go, uh, Zin cite are quite interesting in saying that the use of transnational networks is often similar from one generation to another, uh, which tells us how super diversity in itself um, can be very similar in some experiences, yet so different at the same time. Uh, I'm gonna end here, although um, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I thought it was uh, thought provoking and it's always fun to revisit someone's uh, scholarship such as Professor Guo's. Thank you both, uh, Drs. Cho and Mengxiang, and your inputs make the session um, even richer.